Our next topic is the molar heat capacity of a gas. Now we talked about it a little bit before, but let's summarize what we know so far. First of all, we have the first law of thermodynamics that says that the change in internal energy is equal to the heat added to the gas minus the work done by the gas. We also have the ideal gas equation that relates the three equations, or not the three variables of state, pressure, volume, and temperature to one another uh, via the number of moles and of course the gas constant. We also have learned that in the simplistic case where the, constant, where the pressure is constant, the work is always equal to the pressure times the change in the volume of the gas. And then finally, we've also learned that the change in the internal energy of a gas is equal to N C sub V delta T. N is the number of moles, delta T change in temperature, and C sub V is the molar heat uh, or molar heat capacity of the gas. And here we have the three C sub Vs for monatomic, diatomic, and triatomic gases, which are approximately equal to 3 halves R, 5 halves R, and 7 halves R, which are related to the number of degrees of freedom the molecules have in their ability to um, absorb kinetic energy. So now we have in front of you here a diagram. It's called the pressure volume diagram. Pressure on the vertical axis, volume on the horizontal axis. I have two lines here, which are what we call isotherms. Anywhere along these lines, the temperatures are the same, and we'll talk about that a little bit more detail later. So on the left line, we have T sub naught, T initial, and on the right line, we have T final. So the temperature is at a certain temperature right here, T sub zero, on this point, state one. And then when I reach state two or state three, since they're on the same isotherm, the final temperature of the gas at that point is the same for either state two or state three. Notice when the gas changes from state one to state two, the volume does not change, remains constant. And when the gas changes from one to three, from state one to state three, the pressure doesn't change. These little arrows here typically indicate the direction that indicates how this, the gas changes its state. Now, let's explore what happens when we go from state one to state two, and we start off with the first law of thermodynamics, delta U is equal to Q minus W. Now, W is the work done by the gas, but since the volume doesn't change, if the volume doesn't change, you cannot do any work. If delta V is zero, work must be zero. So in the case of going from one to two, since the volume doesn't change, no work is done by the gas. So we can say that the delta U is equal to Q minus zero, or simply equal to Q. We know that delta U, no matter what, is always equal to N C sub V delta T. So when we plug that in for delta U, we have N C sub V delta T is equal to Q. Well, if it's equal to Q and Delta U is equal to NC sub V delta T. That means Q also must be NC sub V delta T. Now, notice that C sub V means that the volume didn't change. And when I go from 1 to 3, uh, from 1 to 2, indeed, the volume did not change. So this is the appropriate way in which you can write that the heat transfer is equal to this if the volume doesn't change. So conclusion, Q is equal to NC sub V delta T if volume is constant. And so therefore we use C sub V in the circumstance. Now, what if we go from state one to state three? Again, let's start with the first law of thermodynamics, which says that delta U is equal to Q minus W. Now notice that um, the pressure does not change, so the W must equal P delta V. So we can write that delta U is equal to Q. Now notice heat is added to the gas, but the volume changes, which means we cannot use C sub V. In this case, we need to use C sub P. C sub P is also a molar heat capacity of a gas, but this is a different C because that's where the pressure is constant and not the volume is constant. So we can say that if this is Q minus uh, P delta V. And then we can also say that delta U is equal to Q, which must be N C sub P delta T minus P delta V. All right, now I didn't write that very carefully. I want to make sure that you recognize that this is a U and this is a V. So let me be a little bit more careful. So this is delta U, put a nice little bow on it, and this is delta V, make it a sharp V like that. All right, now we also know that delta U is always equal to N C sub V delta T. 
So this is n c sub v delta t is equal to n c sub p delta t minus p delta v. Now if I move this over to the left side, I have n c sub v delta t minus n c sub p delta t is equal to minus p delta v. That's a sharp v there. All right, now I can factor out an n and a delta t. So this is c sub v minus c sub p times n delta t is equal to minus p delta v. And then to get rid of this minus, I'm going to flip these two around and make sure I put parentheses around it like that. So I have c sub p minus c sub v times n delta t is equal to the positive of p delta v. Now finally, what I can do is I can move the n delta t over here. So I can say that this is c sub p minus c sub v is equal to p delta v divided by n delta t. Now, now I need help from this equation right here. Now I need to go to pv equals nrt. So in the case, since I went from 1 to 3, right, this is the case where I went from state 1, let's make sure we write that, state 1 to state 3, and that's the case where the pressure did not change, so P didn't change, what I can do here is I can take this equation, and for that same state I can write P times delta V equals nr times delta t. With other words, if p is constant and I change v, then t has to change on the other side. Which means that if I write the nr over here, I can write this as p over nr is equal to delta t divided by delta v. Which is what I have over here, except in reverse. So I can flip that over, I can say delta v divided by delta t is actually nr over p. So I can say nr over p is equal to delta v over delta t. I can replace that in here. And so I can write that c sub p minus c sub v is equal to p over n times delta v over delta t, which is nr over p. nr over p, which means that the n's cancel out and the p's cancel out, which finally tells me that c sub p minus c sub v is equal to r or c sub p is equal to c sub v plus r and that's a big conclusion in other words the molar heat capacity of a gas depends on whether or not the volume changes or the pressure changes or better said Depends on whether or not the volume stays constant or the pressure stays constant. So the heat added to a gas really depends upon whether or not the volume stays constant or whether or not the pressure stays constant. And so we'll we use C sub P or C sub V depending upon which process we're following. And since we already know that C sub V is equal to these three values for monatomic, diatomic, and triatomic molecules, and realizing that C sub P is C sub V plus a whole R, I simply have to add an R to each one of those. So I can say that C sub P is equal to 3 halves R plus an R, which is 5 over 2 R. When I have a monatomic molecule, C sub P is equal to 7 over 2 R, which means 5 over 2 R plus R, which is 7 over 2 R for a diatomic molecule. And finally, C sub P is equal to 9 over 2R for a triatomic molecule. So this is really big because what I can do now is I can calculate the heat added to a gas if the volume stays constant or I can figure out the heat added to a gas if the pressure stays constant by knowing the molar heat capacity of a gas. So it's not as simple as what we're used to with a gas. We really have to understand whether or not the volume stays constant or the pressure stays constant to make sure we use the right molar heat capacities of the gas.